Hey, we're in our series uh, on the book of Daniel. We're calling it uh, the Prophet Daniel's Fantastical Guide to Thriving in Babylon. And we're in Daniel chapter 9. So if you've got a Bible, go to Daniel chapter 9. If you didn't bring one, there's one that looks just like this one I'm going to be using. Um, and if you go to page, it's, it's in front of you there in the pew rack, uh, go to page 734, you will find uh, Daniel chapter 9. Um, if you're not used to navigating your way through the Bible, on that page you'll see two columns. You see a big number nine. That's the chapter number. The little numbers in the sentences, that might be kind of weird. You're not used to that as you read books. Um, those are like, uh, those are verse numbers, so it's kind of like an address, a way to find your way. I'm going to be reading here in a little bit from Daniel 9. A lot of you probably know the, the, the or seen the classic movie, The Wizard of Oz. Uh, know the story of Dorothy who's running for her, for her life from a, a tornado. This tornado is kind of just kind of sucking up everything in its, in its path and she's looking for cover. She tries to get into a cellar. The cellar doors are locked. She can't get in there so she runs into the house and she's hiding in her bedroom. And as she's in the bedroom, a window shutter is loose, strikes her in the head, knocks her unconscious. She comes to as the house is spinning round and round in this twister and it comes down down with a thud in Munchkin land, which then prompts the beginning of a long journey that she's going to have, and she's going to meet some friends along the way, a cowardly lion in search of courage, a tin man in search of a heart, and a scarecrow in search of a brain, um, and uh, they make it to this place called the Emerald City in search of Oz, and um, at the end of the story, at the end of this journey, Dorothy has a longing in her heart, and the longing is to go home. And uh, there's this good witch, her name is Glinda, and uh, I hope I'm not spoiling this for you, right? We've all seen this, right? Uh, it, uh, and she says, here's how you get home. She's supposed to click her ruby slippers together um, and say, you know, there's no place like home, there's no place like home, there's no place like home. And as she says this, her technicolor dream world of Oz is transported. She's spinning again, and it, it, she returns to the sepia tone colors of Kansas, which no offense to those of you who are from Kansas, but uh, she comes and she's so excited to be home. And I think we can relate. If you've ever, maybe you've been on a business trip and you've longed to be home, or maybe you've been on vacation and you've longed just to be back in your own bed, um, or just just the, maybe a hard day at work and you're coming home and you've got two little kids that are run down the driveway, throw their arms around you. A great place, a home is like a place to be accepted and loved unconditionally, and there is no place like home. And when you get to Daniel chapter 9, we actually, this is, this is Daniel's longing. He wants to go home. In fact, as he's longing to go home, he's, 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 these chapters, when you get towards the end of, of Daniel, they're actually out of order chrono, uh, chrono, chrono, chronologically. Thank you for those of you who helped me say that. Um, th this is in the first year of King Darius, and so this is actually, this chapter happens before the, the lion's den situation in chapter 6. And he's reading in uh, the prophet Jeremiah's scroll, uh, he's reading about this exile, and he's likely reading Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10, which says, you will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. There it is. I'm going to bring, there's no place like home, I'm going to take you home home and Daniel's reading this he's now he's he's in his 80s he was a young man when he was uprooted from Jerusalem and he was exiled to Babylon and he wants to go home he wants the land uh, that was that belonged to Israel and to Judah and Jerusalem to be restored he's longing for restoration he's longing for God to rescue him and restore those those good old days those those moments of when when he was walking closely uh, with his people and worshiping the one true God and I don't know about you but it, but you've probably had a, a longing in your heart at some point in time maybe you're here and you're longing for for God to restore something to you Maybe there's, there, was, there was a time where, where something was, you know, you had this friendship and, and it was very close, but something happened. Maybe there was conflict or maybe just, just distance and that friendship is, is not what it used to be. You long for the restoration of that. Or perhaps there was a time where you didn't battle depression. But now it's a, it's a reality, and you long for the days for God just to lift that gray cloud off of you. In fact, as we enter into these fall months, as gray begins to settle in again, you kind of feel yourself being triggered. 
And you're asking God, say, God, would you restore my joy? Maybe you've been married for quite some time. In those early years of marriage, they were fantastic years. But as you as you've gone along, there's just been some there's just been some friction, and and you feel like that you know that that, that intimacy, that passion, that 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 joy of friendship and being married just isn't there anymore. Or, or maybe it was a son or a daughter who, who's, uh, who's walked away from the faith and um, the joy of seeing them worship and love Jesus is, is those days are gone. You're loving, you would just love it if God would restore that. We probably could all have our own situations. We could, we could describe those moments maybe from the past or one you're, you're in today in which you're saying to God, God, I, I would long for you to restore to me my joy. And, and Daniel, he's in this place. He's longing to go home. And, um, and as he realizes that Jeremiah has prophesied that these 70 years and then they get to go home. He realizes that those, those years are up. He begins to respond, and he responds by praying. And actually what he does is he gives us a bit of a pathway, a map of, of how to pray for a rescue or how to pray, ask God, God, would you, would you move in my life like I've seen you move in other people's lives? Would you, would you, Lord, restore joy? Would you restore your people? Would you restore me? Um, I want to read this, and what we're going to see here is we're going to see a bit of a pattern in, in, in Daniel's prayer in chapter 9. And as we illuminate that pattern, then what we're going to do is we're actually not just going to hear about it, we're going to do it. We're going to pray together. We're going to, as a church, we're, we're going to, we are going to engage, and this is part of our worship today, of in the same, same prayers that Daniel was praying in our own situations, in a situation for our church and our world. So Daniel chapter 9, I'm just going to jump in here, verse 3, uh, actually verse 2, because it picks up the story here. During the first, reign, first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from the reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are in the right. But as you see, our faces are covered with shame. This is true of all of us, including the people of Judah and Jerusalem and all Israel, scattered near and far, wherever you have driven us because of our disloyalty to you. O Lord, we and our kings, princes, and ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. But the Lord, our God, is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord, our God, for we have not followed the instructions he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has disobeyed your instruction and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. So now the solemn curses and judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured down on us because of our sin. You have kept your word and done to us and our rulers exactly as you warned. Never has there been such a disaster as happened in Jerusalem. Every curse written against us in the law of Moses has come true. Yet we have refused to seek mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and recognizing his truth. Therefore, the Lord has brought upon us the disaster he prepared. The Lord our God was right to do all these things. For we did not obey him. And we'll stop there. We'll pick it up here in a second. But Daniel is doing right from the very beginning. If you haven't picked it up, he's doing this. Uh, he's owning sin and confessing it. He, he's owning sin. Now, let me just kind of break this. Two things I want you to, to, to know. First thing, I want us to understand what sin is. Because that's the word, uh, we, we kind of go failure or mistake. Um, but, but the Bible kind of breaks it down for us so that we have a clear picture of what sin is. One of the pictures that scripture gives us is uh, sin is, like, if you can picture a target with concentric circles with a bullseye in the middle, and then picture an archer pulling back the, the bowstring on a bow and then releasing an arrow towards the target. The arrow flies towards the target, and, um, and it, it misses the bullseye. Maybe it hits the target, but it, it misses the target. 
And that's one of the pictures that Scripture gives us. It's to miss the mark. It's to, it's to, this, this is where you're supposed to, I'm just off a little bit. I missed the mark. That's one picture that the Scripture gives us of sin. But there's more. There's a second, uh, there's a word that's used. Some of you prayed this when you grew up learning the Lord's Prayer. You prayed, Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's to, it's to trespass or to cross a boundary that we shouldn't cross. Um, a lot of years ago, and I'm banking that it's so long ago that the statute of limitations is over so I can share this story, uh, that I, I was hunting, it was deer season, I'm with a friend, we're in a truck, we're driving down a logging road. To the left on the road, the, this is huntable land, you can hunt over here. To the right, you're not even supposed to put your foot on this land. That is, it's, it's illegal to go over there. We're driving down this road, I'm with a friend, I'm looking to the left, and I'm looking for deer. My friend stops the truck, and he's all excited, and, and he turns the truck off, and he, and he gets out of the truck, he grabs his rifle, and I'm looking over here to the left, right, where, I, don't, I do not see a deer, which is not unusual, I'm colorblind, so I have a hard time seeing him anyways, and, um, and he grabs his rifle, and then he lays it across the hood of the truck, and aims up to the right. And I'm like, what is going on here? And I'm looking up to the right, and then I hear the crack of a shot. And, and he's excited and he takes the rifle, puts it in the back of the truck and, and he runs in and he goes, I just shot a deer. It's up, it's up there. And, and I'm, we're not supposed to go up there. And I looked at it, I know. And he's quick, we gotta run up there and drag that deer across the road and get it to the right, get it to the, the, the legal side. And so I'm with him running up the hill in the illegal territory going, what am I doing here? How did I get roped into this? And then we're up there, and sure enough, there's a deer down. We're looking at it, and then we hear another truck coming. And, um, and he says, quick, hide. They can't see us up here. We'll be in big trouble. So I'm behind a tree like this, and, I, and I'm literally thinking to myself, I'm like, there's no place like home. There's no place like, right? That's where you're at. I'm, I'm thinking... I am an elder of a church. How did I get myself in this position? This is not going to make the papers. This is not good. And um, the truck goes by. They don't see us. We get down. And, and then we, get, we, we drag the deer down. He says, Here, you tag it. You can have it. I'm like, I do, I do not want this deer. I want nothing to do with this whole situation. I don't know how I got into this. And we cross the boundary. And sometimes people cross boundaries and they drag you with them right? And you know what it feels like when someone crosses a boundary with you. You know the feeling. You, you know what, what, what you feel inside. And friends, here's, this is what God feels. We cross boundaries with him. We go places that we shouldn't go. He has those same feelings. He calls this sin. Sin is to miss the mark. Sin is to cross the boundary. It's to trespass. And the third thing that sin is, is sin is lawlessness. It's a spirit of lawlessness. The best picture I can give you, it's when, you're, when you tell your child to go clean their room, and you tell them again and again to go clean the room, and, and finally they go clean the room. They're going to go clean the room, but they're going to let you know that they don't like it. And so they're just going to stomp their feet all the way to the room, and they're going to clean the room, but they're going to make a scene. That's, that's an attitude of sinfulness. And what, what, what scripture teaches about us about sin is that, yes, it's, it's missing the mark, that's true, but it's also crossing boundaries, but it's also what's going on in our hearts and our minds and our attitudes as it relates to God. And Daniel is praying for a rescue. He's praying for restoration, and so he's confessing sin. But note this, he doesn't just confess his sin. He confesses our sin, He's bringing the collective sin of the people before God. He's, he's, obviously, he's going to confess his own wrongdoing, places where he missed the mark or he crossed a boundary or he possessed an attitude that he shouldn't have. But he's also confessing and owning the sin of his people. And he's reflecting to the Mosaic law. He's probably going back to places like Deuteronomy chapter 28 and realizing that we're just getting what we deserve uh, because in, in Deuteronomy chapter 28 it says if you, if you disobey, there's all these consequences. And one of them in, in chapter 28 verse 36 says, the Lord will exile you and your king to a nation unknown to you and your ancestors. There in exile, you will worship gods of wood and stone. You will become an object of horror, ridicule and mockery among all the nations to which the Lord sends you. And that's exactly 
where God's people are, and God's people need a rescue. Daniel looks back to the old covenant. If we were to confess and own sin, what we could do is we could look to the new covenant. In fact, Paul, writing about the last days, describes what sin would look like in the last days. He writes to his spiritual son, Timothy, and says, You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. And and the fact of the matter is is that when, when Daniel is looking for a rescue, he goes and he looks and he sees, what's my contribution personally that got us into this situation? And what's our contribution? What do we need to own individually and collectively? And Daniel begins by just confessing it and saying, you know what, God? We're getting just what we deserve. And we're just making you know that you already know this, but we're just telling you, finally, we know this. Daniel then moves from confession, and we'll just kind of keep reading the story here in Daniel 9, uh, verse 13. 15, it says, O Lord, our God, you brought lasting honor to your name by rescuing your people from Egypt in a great display of power. But we have sinned and are full of wickedness. In view of all your faithful mercies, Lord, please turn your furious anger away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. All the neighboring nations mock Jerusalem and your people because of our sins and the sins of our ancestors. You're looking for a rescue. You're wanting God to restore to you. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's you're just your own relationship with Jesus. Maybe it's your, your, your joy. Um, and, you're, and you're owning your sin and you're confessing it. And the second thing Daniel models for us is this. It's remembering the past mercies of God and asking him to show mercy again. He's reflecting on the reality that God's people found themselves in a desperate situation once before. It was in Egypt. They were enslaved. And what God did is he, with great displays of power, he delivered his people. We're talking the Red Sea. We're talking manna in the wilderness. That God did amazing things in delivering his people. And once again, his people need deliverance. And so he's saying, God, you did it in the past. Would you do it again? In whatever situation, and you're looking for God to, to move on your behalf, you're longing for a move of God. You're longing for a move of God, not just individually, but you're, maybe you're longing for a move of God in the church. That the beauty of Christ will be restored to the church. And so what, what we might do is maybe, you're, maybe it is a, a, a prodigal son or daughter that, that's wandered away. And you're, you're hearing stories of other people. And you're thinking about how their, their kids are coming home. And, and, and oftentimes what happens is we can drift to despair and say, well, why doesn't that happen for me? But what we can do is we can say, God, you showed mercy in that situation. You brought joy to that person who was struggling with de- depression. You restored that marriage that looked like it was going to break up. And I saw you do it there. You showed kindness and mercy in that situation. Would you do it again? And would you do it in my situation? And so what Daniel was doing, he's saying, God, you are merciful. And I'm simply coming to you and I'm saying, do it again. And when that happens, what happens is it, it, it allows hope to be rekindled. It, it, just, it just gives the door. It cracks the door for hope to germinate and begin to grow in our hearts. Is say, God, this is, this is not foreign territory for you. I'm just pleading with you. Would you do that very thing in my life? If you're looking for God to restore something, if you're looking for a, a rescue, we, we begin by just owning our contribution, whether it's individually or collectively, reminding him that he's, he's, this, this is something he's done before. Would you do it again, Lord? Would you show your kindness and mercy? And in verse 17... We get the last section of his prayer. It says, O our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead. For your own sake, Lord, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. O my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, Forgive. 
O Lord, listen and act. For your own sake, do not delay, O my God, for your people and your city that bears your name. Daniel owns and confesses his sin. He remembers the past mercies of God. And then in the last part of his prayer, he pleads with God to do this for the sake of his great name. God, your name is attached to the city that's in, it's destroyed. Your, your, your name is going down with this ship. And for the sake of your great name, Lord, would you, would you rescue, would you restore so that awe could be attached to your name once again? And, and, and it, this isn't some manipulative trick that Daniel's engaging in here. This is literally a passion of his that the name of Jesus Christ, the name of God would be extolled and exalted and that once again awe would be attached to it. And, um, and, and so he's, for the sake of it, he's got to be thinking again of Moses and this one situation in, in the wilderness, the people have been rescued and uh, Moses, he cries out for God to move on behalf, not of the people, but on the behalf of his own character and his own reputation. The, the people are out of Egypt and Moses is on the mountain and it's the, you know, the writing of the Ten Commandments. It's a significant moment uh, between God and Moses and the people. But as Moses is on the mountain, down in the valley, the people are, they've made a golden calf and they're worshiping an idol and they're throwing a big party. And God, he's had it. You, you ever been at a, point with someone or some people where you're like, you know what? I just can't take this anymore. I mean, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. I've, I've been patient. I've instructed. I've tried to work with them and I did. They just don't get it. I'm done. I'm out. I, I, I'm just talk to someone else. This is where God is at. In fact, he's come to the point where he's like, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do, Moses. Well, what's going on down there? What I want to do is I'm just going to wipe those people out. I'm going to, just, I'm going to take my etch sketch I'm going to shake it. I'm going to start all over again. But with you, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And what Moses does is he exercises amazing spiritual leadership. Listen to what Moses and what he says to God. He says, Lord, why are you so angry with your own people whom you brought from the land of Egypt with such great power and such a strong hand? Why let the Egyptians say, ah, their God rescued them with with the evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountains and wiping them from the face of the earth? Turn away from your fierce anger. Change your mind about this terrible disaster you have threatened against your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You bound yourself with an oath to them, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven, and I will give them all of this land that I have promised to your descendants, and they will possess it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster he had threatened to bring on his people. The reason Moses intercedes is not necessarily for the sake of the people, but for the sake of what the world will say about God. Friends, when we're looking for a rescue, when we're looking for a restoration, and especially when it comes to, we're talking about thriving in Babylon, and we're talking about the, the, the church, our church, the church, the big C church, Salem Kaiser, and the U.S. church, a global church. Oftentimes we see such a huge need of restoration. And for God to, to make his name great in the church. And we also long for that in our families. We long for that to be our own experience. And so Daniel shows us a pathway in which we can own our contribution to the mess that has been created individually, collectively. And then we can ask God for his mercy. He's done it before. God, do it again. And we can ask him to do it for the sake of his great name. Not our name, but for his name. So today, we're going to do that very thing. Laura and the team are going to come join me out here. And we're going to enter into this Daniel prayer. We are going to own our sin and confess it. We are going to ask God to show his mercy. And we are going to ask him to make his name great. At the beginning, what we're going to do is when it comes to owning our sin in our confession, I'm going to ask you to do something. There, there should be paper in the pews. There's like a sermon notepad. You can just peel off a paper. I'd love it if you grab one of those. And um, and there should be pencils uh, in the pews there, and uh, you could probably borrow one here. Um, And I I would love it if we would just think about 
okay, Lord, where, where am I asking you? Where do I want you to move? And it's okay to start individually. Okay, God, God here's where I want you to move, move in my life. And then here's where I want you to move in, in, in your church. And you would begin just to start confessing, Lord, here's my contribution to the mess that has been made. Um, and you just write it on there. Think individually and then think collectively. And just spend some time praying through that. And then what I'm going to ask us to do is, as an act of worship, when you're ready, um, to come and to place your paper, fold your paper up, you can just put it in one of these baskets up front. We have baskets up in the balcony, towards the back of the balcony. Just when you're, when you're ready, you can come and you can take your confessions and put them in the basket. Um, and now maybe you're wondering, okay, so I... You know, I don't. I don't know where to start. Let me. Well, let's just seed it. Seed some of the things that uh, we might want to confess from that passage in Timothy that Paul wrote about. I just, I just pulled some of these these topics out of that passage, where Paul talks about in the last days there'll be a love of self, a love of money, boastful, proud, scoffing at God, people that are disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, that nothing is sacred anymore. There's people who are unloving, unforgiving, slanderous. There's no self control cruel and hating what is good, reckless, puffed up with pride, loving pleasure rather than God, and religious hypocrisy. Maybe there's something in that list that would be a catalyst for you that would sort of say, you know what, there, there might be something on that list that I could own, and that actually makes me think of something else. And as I look at, at, at the global church, I think, you know, I, I think this is something we need to confess co- collectively. I would love it if we would just take some time, write that down, and Lord and the team are going to lead us. We're going to just sing some songs of confession and we're going to pray and, and then we're going to ask God to show mercy and ask him to make a great name. And would you, when you're ready, would you enter into worship and begin doing this by spending some time confessing? Let's worship our Christ.